Welcome to Chef Marketing Academy. Today's lecture is on creating the global mindset. As you know, the world economy is becoming more and more global. However, the mindset of managers and business leaders is still very much domestic centric. And the best way to understand that is to look at the board of directors of world-class companies. And if you simply look at the backgrounds of those directors, most of them are from the same country of origin where the world-class company began its journey, even though it may be a multinational. It is relatively true also, surprisingly, of the management team. Often it has that what one calls in the academic world an ethnocentric culture. It is true for American companies, German companies, French companies, Indian companies, Chinese companies, Japanese companies makes no difference. So this lecture is try, will try very hard to convince the audience why a global mindset is not only a nice thing to do, but is going to become more and more a necessity in the future. So let's start the journey. The need for global mindset is arising because of a two-dimensional shift. More and more competition, which used to be domestic primarily. So in each country, the largest competitors will be from the same country such as, for example, Whirlpool competing with General Electric and competing in this case with Electrolux, which is through acquisition has become a more a global company. But this is very common Goodyear competing with BF Goodrich and Firestone at one time. But as the competition is becoming more and more global, as we'll show you with some examples, and as the markets themselves are becoming more and more global, the domestic mindset has to shift toward a global mindset. So let's look at the globalization of competition. The best place to really understand the globalization of competition is the auto industry. You might remember that till very recently, the only competition in the U.S. was among the big three, as we used to call them, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Similarly, the big three in Japan, Toyota, Nissan, and Honda, and the Royal Niche players. True of Europeans, German car makers competed with German car makers. The French competed with French. The Italians competed with Italians. There was not even a pan-European architecture until the evolution of European Union. Today, that industry is truly globally competitive, which means Toyota is competing with the Europeans and the Americans. The Germans are competing with everybody practically. And there's a huge amount of consolidation taking place in the industry, such as Chrysler being bought out by Fiat recently. So as the industry has a globalization of competition, it has to think more broadly by definition. Who is my competitor? What is my differential advantage? And that she begins to shift from a domestic perspective to a global perspective. This is absolutely true with probably the most intense competition that I have seen has been in the cell phone business and in the smartphones. Journey has just begun. Uh, cell phone industry that began with Motorola as a pioneer was taken over by Nokia. It is now Samsung. Tomorrow will be Chinese manufacturers. And then the smartphone journey the same way already looks like a globally intensive com competitive industry. Also surprisingly happening more and more with the wireless operators. Even though wireless operators are licensed more for domestic licenses, but through alliances and as well as in fact through acquisitions, they are creating a global footprint such as a Vodafone. And this is absolutely true in the airline industry, obviously, where the airline industries have become 
pretty global through creating alliances such as the Star Alliance and of course uh, the American Airlines Alliance uh, which is one world. So ultimately you see the alliances as a way of creating a global architecture to compete on a worldwide basis. The examples of companies, especially from emerging economies of Tata T as a major global competitor to Unilever, Huawei Technologies competing with uh, Lucent Alcatel on the one hand and Siemens etc. on the other hand, InBev which is a technically a Brazilian company buying out the largest uh, beer company in America Budweiser, South African brewing companies buying out the second largest miller and therefore competition is no longer domestic and I use these examples deliberately because these are all emerging economy multinationals becoming global aspiring to become global and of course the Europeans are buying out the Americans, Americans are buying out the Japanese it just goes on so competition is already globalizing or has become global. As you might know, with a colleague of mine many years ago, I evolved a theory called the rule of three, that in every contested market, ultimately through shakeout mergers as the industry matures, there is a room for only three big players, not two, not four, not five, and everybody else has to become a niche player or exit the market. Now this is becoming a global rule of three across industries. So competition is getting globalizing. Similarly, the markets are also getting globalizing. Today, the new middle class that is emerging in emerging economies such as Africa, China, India, Latin America look just like the young people all over the world. Their preferences are the same, both for products, lifestyle and brands. So the world is globalizing also from a market perspective. You see the examples of McDonald's without as very, very small changes in the menu basically are globally operating. Starbucks does a great job worldwide. In fact, the biggest growth markets for Starbucks and for Coca-Cola turns out to be China and India. Coca-Cola just announced that they will invest almost six to eight billion dollars in China for putting investment in the capital uh, which is the bottling plants and they announced very recently they will do the same thing in India with five six billion dollar of additional commitment. Any market that is technology agnostic, in other words the technology is riding above any cultural differences, you will see the globalization of the markets. I mean this is obvious examples is the HDTV in consumer electronics, the smartphones again, any technology product is basically upfront having globalization of the markets, even though competition may be local at the same time. And by the way, this is very true I find in the industrial markets, especially in a B2B environment where the industrial electronic components such as the chips for example or even maybe the software like enterprise softwares, Oracle software for example or SAP software really are truly global in nature from a market perspective. And of course we have seen the social media, uh, nothing but already looking global upfront from a user viewpoint or from a customer viewpoint. I'm absolutely amazed China the love affair with American brands. It's incredible to see every American brand is highly sought after by the Chinese. Partly because Chinese local brands do not deliver the quality or the image or both. But all emerging economies aspire to own and enjoy foreign brands, especially from advanced countries, especially from Germany, especially from America and some from Japan. So given this, the markets are also globalizing and therefore we have a need for, in fact, a global mindset. I wanted to look at four major drivers of globalization and conclude that globalization even if it may have uh, fits and starts, it may have some setbacks is inevitable. 
Despite the protest worldwide about the impact of globalization on changing cultures, changing people's lifestyles, environmental footprint, I think the journey is inevitable. Very similar to industrialization where we had the same set of concerns, just going from agriculture to the industrial economy. And today we are going to have the same sort of debates and concerns and maybe even the protest. But if you analyzed most of the protest, it has to do more with economic uncertainty, economic devastation through globalization, but I think the journey is inevitable. So here are the four major drivers for globalization. The first one is the creation of the WTO and what we call, what is known as FTA, free trade agreements. So World Trade Organization was created by more nations together than any other consortium that I can think about to liberalize their markets from trade restrictions. The old tariff regime and what used to be called the GATT agreements, general trade agreements and tariffs, etc., is abolished because the domestic economies were not doing well and therefore the policy makers and the leaders of the world decided trade would be another way to create more growth in the world economy. And now more and more you see free trade agreements between nations. America just signed an agreement with Chile, Colombia for example, and many of the Latin American countries. There are free trade agreements within ASEAN bloc. ASEAN as a bloc in Asia already has a free trade agreement with Korea, also with Japan, and maybe mainland China. People are waiting for India to announce free trade agreements with lots of major uh, countries such as uh, European Union in general or Germany. You already have the British Commonwealth which is a group of nations under the British old empire and they are still having a lot of trade. So free trade agreement is clearly one. So we have an enormous reduction of trade and tariffs. Surprisingly, we have a privatization of many market monopolies, especially in infrastructure industries, such as, for example, um, railroads, telephone, clearly, utility industries, and those are creating more the forces of globalization because you liberate the market and everybody is allowed to compete in that market, not just the domestic players. And best thing I can tell you is that the ex-communist countries are probably the best capitalists today. Which means that the new mantra of communism is capitalism. That we can do well for the masses, not, not through the communist ideology, where state owns everything. There are no private property rights whatsoever. Instead, they are saying, let's empower people and democratize capitalism. So the masses actually begin to own businesses, become entrepreneurs, become millionaires, billionaires. And if you look at the rapid change in the Chinese economy, in less than 30 years, it's absolutely incredible journey that in less than 30 years, what took America maybe 100 years, they're able to achieve in producing wealth on the one hand and income and livelihood on the other hand. There are more millionaires made every decade in China than any other place in the world. India is not far behind. And if you think what India and China is able to do, just watch till Africa rises. It's the same phenomenon because all of the restrictions around the capitalistic model are being eliminated or at least liberated or liberalized. Second major force is the growth of those emerging markets. They are all transitioning from agriculture to the modern industrial economies where manufacturing is the driver. They all have aspirational growth. As I mentioned earlier, the middle class in all those countries wants to be forming modern uh, homes. Therefore, they have a need for housing. They have a need, in fact, for appliances. They have a need for anything in the house. And that's a huge market that arises. And all of a sudden, that growth 
it, therefore everybody has to participate in that growth for their own survival and success. And as you, if you look at the S&P 500 companies from the US, as it is true of the Germans, as it is true of the British and the Japanese, it's the same thing. You will find that their future lies more and more with emerging economies and all of them are aggressively investing in those emerging economies. And technology advances have enabled emerging economies to rise much faster. There are authors and experts who have written the impact of cell phones alone on the daily lives of most illiterate people in the society. I mean, the contrast is incredible. When you see a traditional farmer who has not changed for, let's say, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, wearing the same garb, toiling the soil the same way, either with a horse or a bullock, uh, and they're not bullock carts, just bullocks, for example, very traditional way of farming, having a cell phone in their hands at the same time. So are those uh, fishermen. We are not talking about big fishing boats. We are talking about one-man operation of a little fishing boat. They go out into the sea, cap capture a fish, maybe 11, 12, a dozen a, a day, but they have a cell phone on which they get the quotations as to where the prices would be better, better for their market. I think that impact of the technology on the human life, especially in emerging markets, is worth looking at. Third is global mergers and acquisitions. I've already talked about InBev, buying out uh, Anheuser Busch or Budweiser brand. Talked about South Africa Brewing, buying out Miller Beer. We have seen the same thing, Grupo Bimbo from Mexico, becoming the largest flower company by, through acquisitions. Acquisitions have been a little more aggressive from emerging economies into advanced economies. An Indian company called Hindalco, which is a part of a large business group called Aditya Birla Group, made an acquisition of the aluminum sheet company uh, called uh, Novelis, headquartered in Atlanta, which is the city I live, and has become one of the largest aluminum manufacturers uh, in the world competing with Alcoa. By the way, the same company, the group, bought Columbia Chemicals in Carbon Black, also headquartered in Atlanta, and now has become number one or number two in Carbon Black all over the world. In industrial raw materials, in agricultural uh, raw materials, you see more and more these global mergers and acquisitions, let's say among the mining companies, for example, taking place. So this is north-south mergers and acquisitions, which means advanced countries investing or acquiring companies in emerging economies, emerging economic companies investing in advanced countries, but there is also a significant south-to-south -south merger, emerging economies buying out companies into other emerging economies, especially the Chinese and the Indians in Africa, in Latin America, in Central America, and especially in places where there are resources. So it's more for race for resources for which they are doing global mergers and acquisitions. And quite a few advanced countries are exiting non-competitive industries by selling the capacity to somebody else. So industry consolidation is taking place because advanced countries are non-competitive. The last area driver is the rise of new multinationals. We already touched upon a few of them. Some of the large Chinese multinationals have an enormous domestic advantage. The size of the domestic market is so large and they are becoming more global. China Mobile, which is the largest mobile telephone operator company in numbers, in terms of subscribers, not in revenue. And now they're flexing their muscle to say, our growth has slowed down in China. Everybody has cell phones. Second cell phone phenomenon is happening. So how can we expand into nearby Asian neighbors, for example? NTT Docomo is now going into India by investing into Tata Telecommunications. And many of the new multinationals, whether they are from uh, Latin America 
or whether they are from some of them from Africa even, some of them from Eastern European countries, wherever they have had a tremendous domestic presence and an advantage having now global aspirations, they would like to become global enterprises for their own growth. And the last point I wanted to make is that some of the best, surprisingly some of the best global enterprises are the state owned enterprises which is an architecture in many of the socialistic and communist countries. They all began as state enterprises. India has some of the largest state enterprises such as Life Insurance Corporation of India, LIC as it is called, Coal India, they have also a, uh, a oil company and then they are all becoming global now especially from a sourcing viewpoint if not from a market viewpoint. So these are the four drivers and therefore the debate always arises. People who still have the domestic mindset very rightfully raise questions about local responsiveness. Markets are different, consumers are different, competitors are different, regulation is different. So how do you balance this is becomes a key debate in creating a global mindset. And I have crystallized that in a two dimensional or a two by two matrix essentially. On the one hand, if global consistency is very important, in some industries it will be more important than others, especially in technology industries where what matters is scale and speed. In one of my other lectures I have talked about the economics of the digital economy and this is a fundamental point that in those uh, digital technologies you cannot remain domestic, you have to have access to global market and you must go as fast as possible. So global consistency is very important in some industries but not in others. Competition may be local, customers may be local. On the other hand, local responsiveness may be very important in some markets and in some industries. So balancing this global consistency, local responsiveness is the key dilemma. Like anything else, it's one that companies have to learn how to manage both at the same time. So in this chart, you will see that if global consistency is not important at all and local responsiveness is not important, then you can remain very domestic, which would be generally true of the unorganized, unbranded makers of products, which is a large segment by the way. In my analysis I find that even in the 21st century, 65% of all consumption in the world is unbranded, highly local. So in that case, global consistency is not relevant local responsiveness is not relevant because you have been doing business locally anyhow. So domestic mindset is okay. But in all other three boxes, we need to have a some form of a global orientation. So for example, if the global consistency is more important than local responsiveness as I mentioned in technology products, some of the industrial products, then export mindset is fine basically thinking like, not exporting but thinking like a product that you make it here for domestic market, same product is appropriate for a foreign market. On the other hand, if global consistency is not important but local responsiveness is important, then you have a model called the global model. Think global, act local as people say or we often call it in the academic world a polycentric or a multi-domestic market orientation where you do have markets that are unique or different by regulation, by culture, whatever the reason is and to accommodate you create a regional architecture. So you say I am a corporation headquartered someplace but then I have a western hemisphere subsidiary, I have a European subsidiary, I have an Asian subsidiary because those three markets by regulation, culture, customers, consumption, whatever the reason is are different and I need to accommodate the differences. Or where both are important, global consistency which basically gives you efficiency, standardization, economies of scale, of procurement, supply chain, 
making, shipping, logistics, however you think it. And local responsiveness is equally important in that market. In that case, you must have a truly what we call a global mindset or a transnational mindset. So the word really should be transnational, local and export are the three different types of global mindset by and large. So let me show you the benefits of global consistency. This is what all of the practitioners and academic scholars have come out with and I've synthesized and summarized it. The first major benefit is significant cost advantage as we have talked about it in product design because the designs are expensive and if you can take the design and take it all over the world you get economies of scale. In making clearly manufacturing whether it's on a dedicated outsourcing basis or making it yourself and of course in selling marketing and customer support. So Dell computers is one of those examples where they have a significant cost advantage if they think from a global consistency perspective. In other words, the same Dell computers or servers will be operable anywhere in the world. Nokia, the same way in the cell phone business. Motorola at one time in semiconductors and today Motorola probably in some infrastructure or in satellite business. Consistency through common image. This is not often talked about but very important. How do you create a common image or a brand a reputation? And one of the best companies surprisingly is IBM. IBM worldwide has a great reputation, common image and one of the reasons how IBM went to our global consistency or one of the ways they did it was to actually consolidate what used to be country by country ad agencies and public relations firms into two major ad agency groups in which they gave the business. In other words, they believe very strongly that both global consistency is very important along with local responsiveness and came out with an architecture. In airlines, this is very common and of course Singapore Airlines is one of the best airlines and one can talk about therefore the global image that you create or a consistency of your image, you have the same message or the same slogan, same way, etc. Tata group is very similar out of India, highly respected group into many, many businesses but need a common brand image which is what they have created called the Tata brand. And Infosys is another Indian company in IT services which has that consistent image anywhere in the world. The third major reason why global consistency is important is to formulate a common competitive strategy. In other words, your competition is the same no matter where you go. So the typical notion is Boeing versus Airbus. Those are the two de facto aircraft manufacturers both for civilian and for military and as you know Boeing and Airbus both now are investing capacity into Europe and America. Airbus just announced recently that they are going to have an assembly plant in Alabama for example. And Boeing will have to do the same thing rather than just export the product, they will have to make it locally someplace outside of America. The traditional rivalry of Coke versus Pepsi is legendary all over the world or Caterpillar and Komatsu. Komatsu was a Japanese company competing on a global basis. Next reason why global consistency is generally leaned toward is getting the maximum mileage out of a good positioning. As you know branding and positioning is not easy and once you succeed you don't want to tamper with it again and again. It's not a fashion industry. You need to just improve a little more make it contemporary as the times go by but it remains the same. So when you have a good positioning, you want to take a leverage. So HSBC as a bank has a great, your world's largest uh, local global bank essentially. They have a nice twist on the whole thing and the brand image is very high. Starbucks same thing, a great positioning what they have anywhere in the world to have a cup of coffee with basically conversation and even allowing you to lounge and sit there rather than just 
take your coffee as a functional thing. It's a meeting place in many ways, like libraries used to be. Think about that. And we already talked about the IBM and the Apple is the same category. So getting a mileage. The best example actually is an old example of Marlboro cigarettes. They finally figured out the right message that what appeals to people who smoke Marlboro, especially men, is the masculinity, the macho image. And they were very successful with the cowboy country theme. Now that's an American symbol. How do you make it global? So what they did was to create cowboys from every country. So you have a Mexican cowboy. You have an Italian cowboy. That makes no sense to me because Italians are lovers, not cowboys, right? And then, of course, you have the uh, New Zealand cowboys. You have the Australian cowboys. It just goes on. And I've seen those commercials. One agency that created an enormous same idea, but localization of the actor, actress as the context. It's not that uncommon, but that image, and that has been a huge message till recently. I'm sure that must be 30, 40 years of the same message that they took it global, and that was very important to get the high mileage out of a good idea or a good positioning. On the other hand, we need the local responsiveness. Where does it come from? There are many, many factors such as government rules, regulations for certification of raw materials, products, product safety. There may be administrative rules about doing business. Should you have a subsidiary, a joint venture, 100% ownership and all this stuff? But the real reason in my, of course, consumer differences, we can all talk about all the time, cultural differences. But I find ultimately the driver for local responsiveness is climatic differences. The tropical climates are different than temperate climates, which are different than Arctic climates for the functioning and use of any product, especially industrial products. We can always think about packaging in the consumer markets all the time in marketing, but the real climatic impact is in industrial raw materials. Some of the very climate sensitive equipment, like farm equipment, for example, it may be aircraft even. I have seen this kind of an impact on tractors, for example, where the dusty and the hot tropical climate, some of the well-groomed computer-based uh, tractors don't work very well. Factories, as you know, have to be conditioned properly for the robots and the computers to work. So I have seen that thing in gasoline. Gasoline has to adjust its composition based upon the altitude and the temperature or from season to season within a country. And most infrastructure industries understand climate is a very key factor to accommodate the local uh, nature of a business by and large. I have a separate lecture on climate consumption and culture, so I would not go into the impact of climate on the way we consume food, clothing, and shelter. I would not go into that in this lecture. But it is an important factor for necessitating local responsiveness. Second reason, of course, is competing with large or powerful domestic competitors. We talked about the global competition of Boeing versus Airbus. And of course, we talked about the uh, Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. But in many other industries, there is already a large domestic competitor. In soft drinks, it was Inca Cola in Peru and in Latin America. And Coca-Cola's biggest competitor was not Pepsi, but Inca Cola. And they couldn't compete with them very successfully. It had a nat nationalism spirit, belief that it comes from some natural um, root, herbal root, etc., therefore medicinal benefit. And they could not compete. Ultimately, they ended up buying the brand. There was a similar competition in Hong Kong called Vita Soy, a product made with vitamins and soybean. And as you know, in many of the emerging economies, the level of protein in the body, even the calorie is below the minimum threshold level. So when you drink this high protein uh, product, you certainly get the energy, whatever you need essentially, along with sugar. And they're major competitor all the time. 
and they were bought out by a competitor. I do remember at one time, and I think it is owned by Quaker Oats and it is now owned by Pepsi, for example. So competing with domestic competitors, beer industry is the classic. In fact, I'm told in Germany, there is not a single national brand in Germany. Beer is all local, local, local. Mobile phone operators by licensing are usually local competitors. So if you enter a market, you have to understand local competition. As I mentioned earlier, the third major reason for local responsiveness is unique legal requirements. Telecommunication industry, utility industry, and many other industries are still regulated, even though they may be privatized, but they're regulated. In America, FCC is a regulator of practically every ICT industry, from cable, surprisingly, to wireless, to the telecom, to broadband or anything. And many of the certified professional services are very much having legal architecture, which is localized, such as, for example, medical doctors. What kind of a degree you earn, how do you do your residency, uh, requires a localization. That is true for accountants, that is true for lawyers, for example. So there are many industries where certification is the one that creates a legal entry barrier in some fashion. You are not allowed to practice that particular profession without certification into that local market. And one of the last reasons is that you have to target different segments. If there is a need to target different segments, which means you are selling in one segment in one market or country, and now you have identified another segment altogether in another market, another country, then you need to localize it. And the best examples are, as I mentioned in China, they adore American brands. So here is a Buick brand in America, almost becoming a senior citizen brand in the same way as Cadillac and Lincoln. Buick brand is the most exciting brand in China. It is a luxury brand. It is a chauffeur driven brand. Isn't that interesting? Because in America, we make big cars relative to Asians or the Europeans. Interesting. So Buick is a luxury car here. Well, we're basically a middle class people car in America. Same thing about the scooters or two wheelers. Uh, their positionings are different in many countries. In advanced countries, they'll be more like recreation things. Uh, let's say Harley Davidson. You don't commute, it's not a livelihood mechanism. In some other countries, two wheelers, such as motorcycles and scooters, are day to day necessities, not only just for commuting, but also as merchants carrying your merchandise and going to places where your customers are. And the last and the most powerful reason is that, and this is the uh, argument people have made, is actually silent languages of different cultures. A great anthropologist from University of Chicago came out with this beautiful article and pointed out five silent languages on which cultures can be mapped and they are different. Silent of uh, friendship is very different. In most countries, you give business to your friends and relatives because you trust them. In Northern European culture, it's the opposite. It's conflict of interest, huge cultural difference, of role of friends in business arrangements, right? He even suggested that there are differences about time orientation, which I have tied up in my lecture on climate, actually that in some countries, time is of utmost importance. You have to be precise on time. In other countries, time is taken, it's okay. Manana, as it is called, all in India, they call it chalta hai. It doesn't matter. My explanation has been climatic, that in countries where climate is the same year around, day to day, time doesn't matter. Mediterranean countries, tropical countries, whereas, in northern European places, there's short window for planting and harvesting. Climate can change radically. If you don't do it on time, you lose the window completely. And therefore, there's a huge time sensitivity in northern European countries, generally as far above the Alps, uh, above the equator, as far below the equator, you will see a lot greater urgency of time. Near the equator, it's 
okay. You can relax. Very interestingly. So that's what it is. That he talked about that. Uh, time, space, the same thing. In many countries, you are used to actually crowd behavior. So you come close to people. The traditional joke we have is that in the same elevator or a lift, when you put four Asians, they will all be in one corner. If you put four Americans, they'll be all in four corners, even though they may be husband, wives, or friends. That's a space, territory, very key. Again, the climatic explanations explains why, but it's interesting. Our possessions. How do you show off that you have a certain class by material possessions? In some countries, possessions is actually inconspicuous consumption. The more wealth you have, the more you consume modestly. In some other countries, the more wealth you have, the more you flaunt with it. Huge difference again, right? And of course, agreement. This is the one that I think friendship and agreement, in my view, are the ones that gets into a lot of cultural issues. In many countries, it is my word that's the ultimate agreement. And I have a social norm that complies, it makes me comply with that uh, consent that I made. Whereas in other countries, only agreement that matters is signing on the dotted line. Till then, you can say anything you want to. Huge difference. Is it a legal framework or is it a social norm framework which varies enormously in countries? Countries that have still remained more traditional use social norms and pressures for compliance on an agreement. And I must tell you, you take industries like the diamond merchants, primarily among the, uh, sort of the Orthodox Jewish community, and now Indian community. It's mind-boggling to watch that one Indian merchant will give hundreds of thousands of diamond package to another merchant, actually not the person himself, but a worker who is basically a delivery person uh, between merchants and between customers with nothing signed. You're basically having your assets walk out of the window with no signature because you know that if there's a violation of the agreement, you will be outcast from the trade altogether. And that was the social compliance that used to be there before we came out with democracy and then we came out the rule of law. Cultures are still not all on rule of law. Many, many occupations are driven by just my commitment of my word against uh, your word kind of a notion. So that's what it is. Guangxi as a principle of reciprocity in China or Chinese culture is very prevalent. Clan behavior in Middle East is very prevalent. And there are so many subcultures in India, each one behaving very differently. And therefore, people have argued that we need to accommodate this local responsiveness. Global mindset is more about attitude than about anything else. And basically, there are three types of global mindset, depending upon your situation, both as a company and as an industry. In the next graph, I have plotted the evolution over time of a corporation and how it evolves in the international arena, starting with the export mindset, then becoming a global company, and then ultimately becoming what we call a transnational uh, mindset. They are all three are mindsets, global mindsets, something about non-domestic mindset. And the complexity rises as you go from one to the other. The export mindset is primarily taking advantage of the country of origin and going all over the world with a common image, etc. It's very simple. Local is the local adaptation, as I mentioned, even though you have a... So in the first case, it says, think uh, local, act global. In the second case would be, think global, act local. And the last one is, think global, act global are the three areas. So we'll just contrast these three different models. And there is a significant amount of good scientific academic research about management practices being different and underlying theories 
of how you should succeed in the business being different also. So what's the export mindset? Think local, act global. Export mindset is best where the country of origin is a distinct and unique competitive advantage. Champagne, French champagne has that. And actually, as you know, the French government has banned any other country using the word champagne unless it is grown in the Champagne County in France. Basically, they have created almost a monopolistic position and whoever wants to buy French champagne has to buy from that country and the export mindset says just figure out your distribution and your local agents in different countries. Image is the same. Actually, nurture, perpetuate, exaggerate that image if possible. This was recently followed by India because India has in one part of India a particular rice that is grown historically called basmati which is very different rice both in texture maybe in nutrition content and it is only grown in that one geographical area so following the French champagne example the Indian government has said you cannot put the word basmati anywhere in the world unless it is produced in that particular state of Punjab as it is called in one of those counties. Hollywood movies, we have seen the thing without regulation even. I mean, there is an image about movies made in Hollywood. They are blockbusters and they have a worldwide patronage. By the way, if you think that's true for Hollywood movies, that is also true for Indian, what is called the Bollywood movies. And surprisingly, some of the Indian actors in the Indian movies called Bollywood movies are more famous as more followers than most American well-known actors because of the sheer size of the country and it goes all over the Indian diaspora as well as in fact the South Asian diaspora. So Indian movies are as popular in Pakistan as they are in the Gulf countries, as they are in Africa or wherever the subcontinent of India have gone and expanded worldwide. And I'm sure it's a matter of time before Chinese movie makers will have figured out that there's a Chinese diaspora where they will go worldwide the same way. German cars in engineering, German reputation and a company like BMW actually promotes that idea that if it's made in Germany, it is at that unique level of excellence in making things, in engineering, etc. So this is clearly the main uh, of aspect of the export mindset. Second one is a global mindset where you think global but act local. That local responsiveness dimension we talked about and global consistency. And the best place this one of course is in automobiles. I'm told Honda Corporation is the one who created this phrase called globalization, which means think global, act local because regulations for product safety, emission control, uh, fuel efficiencies, very country by country. In many countries fuel is so expensive that you have to make engines a lot more efficient. Sizes are small because infrastructure roads are small. So all this stuff basically has motivated auto industry to practice local mindset. As we talked about the automobile Buick, same idea. Media and entertainment clearly fall into this category because you have a language and a cultural context that varies even though the message may be the same. It's the same soap opera, it is the same situation comedy, it is the same drama, whatever it is, but its contextualization varies from culture to culture, country to country, but the message is the same and therefore globalization seems to be the obvious answer. Banks have followed the same thing because regulation does vary country by country about banks are still semi-regulated all over the world as opposed to let's say other financial uh, uh, companies such as hedge funds for example or uh, trading for example. So generally when you have to target different segments then you tend to think of globalization or a global mindset. Uh, the third one is what I call transnational mindset. I like this word transnational coined by Sumantra Goshal and one more of his colleagues. It's very interesting how that word has become probably more meaningful today than ever and hence I have used that word as opposed to global world. 
It says think global, act global. A transnational mindset, my definition, is best where the fusion of cultures, fusion of markets, and fusion of leadership of the organization across countries is key to your global competitive advantage. In other words, country of origin becomes a disadvantage here actually in this particular setting or a scenario. And this is the journey that Tata is going through. It is not just Indian uh, business leaders across business units, but worldwide talent. Samsung is already doing the same thing from a Korean to a truly transnational company. Huawei Technologies, I think from China in telecom infrastructure is planning or has the same idea as does Lenovo as a uh, think pad that they bought from IBM. I think IBM itself is going through this journey and is very likely to therefore have the leadership come from not just America, from all over the world. This is very prevalent at Cisco systems, very prevalent of course in the newer companies such as a Google for example, or Microsoft, or uh, Facebook. You clearly see cultural fusion uh, so the leaders of the company come from different nationalities with different backgrounds, different training, and they are not really kept compartmentalized, but they are fused. It's just one common leadership kind of an idea. In professional services, this is much more happening than we had realized, such as consultancy services, accounting services, uh, legal services, etc., as they become global. So this is the transnational mindset. In the next page, I have therefore identified separations or differences among these three uh, global mindsets. In the export mindset, country of origin is a distinct advantage. It's almost essential and without that, you cannot be globally competitive. In the local mindset, it's blending of the local and then global. Whereas in transnational, it is totally non-existent or should be made non-existent as a prescription because country of origin becomes a liability. Market needs are homogeneous in export mindset. They are diverse in local markets and in transnational markets they are truly blended. Strategy, think local, act global for export mindset. Think global, act local for the global mindset and ultimately think global, act global, which is the transnational mindset. I must tell you, even though we all know that's the journey we should go, there's a huge resistance in corporations. The incumbency of the culture comes in the way. To transform them is not easy. A great marketing thought leader by the name of Professor Theodore Levitt wrote a classic article about globalization of markets in 1983 showing how in some industries think global, act global was the model and got a huge pushback and criticism by his academic colleagues as well as by practitioners. So I think it's basically sort of the orthodoxy of a culture that comes in the way before going all the way to transnational mindset. So the culture, as I pointed out, in the export mindset is very ethnocentric. Everybody should be uh, from the same country managing the business all over the world. This is true in restaurants I find, ethnic restaurants, especially sort of the premium priced etc. They have multiple locations, but they have the same person of country of origin managing all over the world. Same thing is true I find in uh, diamond merchant as I, as I mentioned to you. It is managed worldwide by the same ethnic group essentially whether it's of Indian origin or Eastern European origin or wherever the trade has come from. Whereas the culture in the case of local mindset is polycentric, which means you have a regional model where in Latin America, Western Hemisphere, the head is a Latin American. In Europe, the Western, in the European region, the head may be an European, a French or a German. In Asia, it must be an Asian kind of a mindset. Whereas in transnational mindset, it's fusion, doesn't matter. Leadership is ethnic primarily, local as we mentioned, and transnational. 
and the processes are you extend the same practices that you do, same processes all over the world in ethnocentric or export mindset, whereas you adapt to localization needs in the local mindset, and here you pick best in class. So wherever the best in class is. I do believe that the, among all of these things, the key transformative change is going to be leadership issues. If a company is able and willing to lose the identity of where its leaders come from, it begins to transform into a transnational mindset. Ultimately, at the top, who do you give the responsibility and the authority? Because the person at the top, then if it comes from a different culture and a different way of thinking, will transform it in a very different way. As we have seen in many of the affirmative action areas the same way, that once you have a senior leader who is a woman, she has thought about more inclusiveness about the leadership that reports to her in some fashion. I think it's the same thing here in many ways. So, so I think to me ultimately in all these things is the leadership. So how do we achieve the global mindset? I don't believe any kind of a workshops and seminars are enough. I don't think any kind of a reorganization is not, is not enough. Yes, we can have this leadership that makes a difference. I agree to that. But I think most of that is to embrace practices. I'm a strong believer that I can change the culture by embracing new practices than anything else. If I want to make, bring about an intervention in cultural change, I think practices and processes are very important. So here are the eight different processes or areas with which one can create a global mindset doesn't matter even if you are an export-oriented company or local company or a truly transnational company. So what are those eight? Uh, the first one is embrace global standards, key factor, all the way from R&D. Surprisingly, this is a problem for advanced countries. I am told German engineers in automobiles are so good that they were looking down on Japanese cars till the chief engineer of Mercedes-Benz began to drive Lexus himself and he simply said, these guys are better than us. That admission is very important. As I worked with many laboratories and R&D departments of large companies, I've seen the same thing. In pharmaceutical, I have experienced this thing. In the automotive sector, at the tech center at General Motors, for example, even in Bell Labs, you see this bias. And of course, most universities are the most ethnocentric. Despite faculty from all over the world and students from all over the world, but they think that our way of looking at the world in the way we educate or in the way we do research is the only way, is the right way kind of a notion. So global standards, compare yourself not with other domestic universities, but global universities. And this is a debate going on in the business schools as we see Chinese universities rising in the rankings, especially by Financial Times, some Indian universities rising in ranks, and actually some of the well-known universities out of America sliding in the rank because they only thought about domestic orientation. True in operations, like in R&D, true in HR, human capital, I think is a very key uh, ingredient for success, and of course in processes. Second area, you really have to scale up, probably through acquisitions. It's much easier to acquire a company and then put your mindset behind, whether it's an export mindset, a local mindset, or a transnational. And Mittal Steel has done a good job. It is the Indian steel company based out of UK, has created a large consolidation of uh, many of the steel industries that were collapsing in the late 80s, early 90s, especially with the collapse of communism. Many state enterprises were, steel companies were state enterprises, and Mittal was smart to buy them out. And then, of course, they have merged with Arcelor, so the largest steel companies, Arcelor, Mittal, based in Luxembourg or one of the smaller countries in Europe, for example. 
But Mittal is a great example to say, I can become a global company through scaling up and therefore I begin to have understanding of different cultures and different processes. And hopefully as a transnational company, you pick best in class. Hindalco in aluminum that I mentioned earlier is in the same category. Just going through cultural integration, process integration between novellis here and Hindalco, which are two different cultures, two different mindsets. How do you put them on the same mindset? And Vodafone, which is a large a wireless telephone operator, the largest in revenue, probably second, third largest in number of uh, subscribers, is going through the same thing as they've acquired more and more companies worldwide and created a common brand name, a common processes. That's, that all comes in, but I think there's a common mindset is the one they, that needs to be there. Third area. To be truly globally competitive, whichever mindset you have, is to obtain a low cost of capital. Again, most companies have thought of raising capital in the domestic markets. Some of the emerging companies have now raised capital in the London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, or NASDAQ. But I do believe that capital markets, you need to be all over the world. It changes the mindset because the bankers or the stock exchangers from each country have a very different perspective. Their notion of risk return, their notion of compliance varies enormously. And suddenly you realize your domestic ways are not appropriate or sufficient. So foreign stock exchanges or one gets private equity, which is a very large capital market, or one gets into the debt capital, doesn't matter how, where you go, so I think obtaining low cost capital gives you a tremendous amount of global mindset. You have to make presentations and a roadshow as it is called to raise capital. Deal with the analyst, deal with the investors in any one of these three forms of capital, etc. Next area, very obvious one is earn quality reputation. In other words, don't compromise on your quality. And this is where, as you know, Truly global mindset came among the Japanese corporations after World War II when they decided domestic market is not enough, that the Japanese corporations need to export products, especially to America at that time. Came out with a, a government agency called JETRO that had put quality standards. Surprisingly, they recruited an American Deming. And Edward Deming came out there and taught them. He was a statistician about how to improve your quality. And today, Japanese are the best in quality in anything they do. They're obsessed with quality. Because of that, they have earned a reputation worldwide in everything they do, whether it's um, shipping on the one hand, or industrial chemicals, or pharmaceuticals, or consumer electronics, right? So quality obsession becomes a very key dimension in this global mindset and compete for global awards, not domestic awards in reputation, quality reputation, which means there are global competitiveness, global awards which are given and compete for those, file for those, it is in a different category as opposed to let's say Malcolm Baldridge award for us, a Deming award in Japan for the Japanese corporations. How do we compete worldwide on a global award? Next area is my passion, which is design. Invest in design and research. I think design is much more strategic, more important than research per se, which is more on the engineering side. So design is key. Create intellectual property rights through research and design. And then you create global centers of excellence to have a truly global mindset. Enhance productivity through automation and integration. This is a very controversial idea. It says that the best way to have a global mindset is not relying strictly on the labor pool or labor advantage as emerging economies have such as China, India, or uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, or any countries we can think about. As advanced countries, labor is so expensive and it is being outsourced more and more to emerging economies. Even emerging economies, my view is that cannot survive on labor cost arbitrage. What they have to do is to automate. So how do you automate in a country with a surplus of labor? 
You don't do it till labor becomes a shortage by definition. As it is happening in India in the IT talent, for example, as it is happening in China in the manufacturing, so you begin to get more productivity per worker as opposed to the input side, which is calculated as the amount of wages you will pay relative to the world. So that's very key. And the way to automate, of course, is to put uh, enterprise uh, resource planning tools such as the Oracle, the SAP platforms, or Microsoft, and there are several platforms now. And also go into supply chain management, which means you automate your supply function. Then you automate your customer facing functions, which is called CRM. And ultimately, you move as fast as possible on a global basis to do e-commerce or e-business. So in B2B, this is much easier to do. Our customers are basically the same worldwide. They're all factory people. Procurement departments behave the same way. So you can actually have online procurement and as much uh, online uh, billing and collection and all this stuff, you can do it. Of course, this is happening in the wireless industry in the consumer side more and more. Our uh, process focus is very key to increase productivity, not just automation. And of course, the most famous area for creating productivity out of one headcount is the lean operations, which is all about automation and integration in some fashion. The lean operations is very famous from Toyota, a company which put together four processes together, the TQM quality process, just-in-time process, for example, customer satisfaction process, and of course, um, um, cycle time process. Mass customization, I think, is one more. So there are four processes, mass customization, quality, cycle time, and of course, uh, just-in-time kind of a stuff, right? So those are the things one can do. Next area is uh, create globally admired brands. So the brands that you create are not only admired in your own country, but worldwide. This is where America has done a great job. American brands are icons worldwide. German brands are icons. Japanese brands are icons. So this is a message that goes primarily for emerging economies. Japanese brands used to be laughed at because made in Japan was low quality, low price, but low quality. They began to put quality process, they began to promote their brands, position their brands. And what the Japanese have done, let's say in the 70s and the 80s, Koreans have done it in the 90s and the uh, turn of the century by and large. And now you see more and more Chinese brands and Indian brands following the same process by and large. And a corporate brand is equally important. Are you really a brand uh, that is admired by people? Are you a brand that the consumer customer ins is inspired by? Are you a brand that is related more than just value for money, but it is something that relates to a cause in the society? What we call a purpose-driven brand that all comes here to become globally admired brands. Next one is access to mainstream distribution. Many companies who begin with a great domestic advantage, make a product which is then appropriate for the world markets, tend to have only ethnic distribution systems. Think about Mexican foods in America for a long time. They would be available in Mexican stores, Indian foods in Indian stores, Chinese foods in Chinese stores. But today you see Mexican foods in the main supermarket aisles. In consumer products, this is very difficult to do because the cost of entering mainstream distribution, such as a Kroger, Walmart, is very high, what are called slotting fees. The quality standards of acceptance are very high also. Many of the foreign brands cannot meet the tough standards, let's say Walmart has now today, or what Sears used to have at one time. Because as a retailer, they have to worry about not only reputation and customer satisfaction, but also legal issues. Because if something happens with that product, it is not just the manufacturer, but also the distributor who is held liable by the laws in most countries. So they are the one who screen out products 
that are not as reliable, they are not as safe, etc., making sure that this foreign brand meets all the compliances of a local market by and large. And this kind of a thing has been very true. The Indian diamond cutters, which are the largest in the world, have figured out that they can go through the mainstream distribution, such as the jewelry chain stores like Zale, for example. But I was surprised when I found out that the largest seller of diamonds in America is Walmart or Sam's Club, which is a part of Walmart retail distribution system. And the largest diamond cut sold at Walmart and Sam's are made in India. They are mostly at the lower end of price points. They are not like one carat or a bow, which are very expensive diamonds. As diamond prices have gone up, the smaller diamonds or clusters of small diamonds and jewelry made out of that one begins to become much more affordable to people, kind of a notion, whether those are engagement rings or wedding rings or a typical anniversary gifts or whatever we do about diamonds. And this is true, Unilever learned many, many years ago under British uh, system how to enter into the traditional uh, mom and pop local distribution system. As you know, in many countries, from the manufacturer to the consumer, there may be as many as seven, nine, eleven middlemen. Markets are so fragmented. Most of them have a chronic shortage of capital or warehousing inventory. So how do you enter in that system is a very key to become a mainstream brand. Otherwise, you may be sold as a foreign brand, a luxury brand in some department stores and urban affluent Indians or Chinese can buy your brand. So you have to go into mainstream really to truly get a global mindset. And of course, now in the case of packaged goods industries, mainstream means going to the bottom of the pyramid markets, people below the poverty level. And all kinds of exciting experiments are taking place how to understand that market in this international marketing area. And of course, the master at this game about distribution has been Coca-Cola. You know, we always talk about the Coca-Cola's competitive advantage is its secret recipe, partly true. Its brand name and the way they advertise, partly true. But my view is that the real, real strength of Coca-Cola is its distribution system. In fact, any remote part of any world, any part of the world, you will find, if nothing else, the local natives, the tribal people will give you a bottle of Coca-Cola. It is there. And they've learned how to do logistics and supply chain, especially from bottlers to the uh, retail shop, in a way that's mind-boggling. And to me, that is the key advantage and a differentiator, let's say, against Pepsi or any other soft drink or a beverage maker. So Coca-Cola does a fantastic job of penetrating the most rural population anywhere in the world. And I just learned that Coca-Cola is in all the countries of the world except two, which is mind-boggling. In fact, many governments don't even have their embassies in those countries, but Coca-Cola is present. So this kind of a distribution becomes very key. So let's conclude this lecture. Global mindset is key even if you are a domestic company and the reason is that the world is going to come and compete in your market. Your competition will get globalized and your customers are transforming themselves from what they used to be to be much more into the modern age. Whether you are in advanced country, we have seen a rapid progression from generation to generation as to how much discontinuity is there between the young people and their parents and their grandparents and great-grandparents. It's incredible, as it is true, of course, in emerging markets. There are three levels of global mindset with increasing complexity about managing them. One is the export mindset, other one is the local mindset, and third one is the transnational mindset. Country of origin is a distinct advantage in export markets. However, it becomes a liability in a truly transnational market. A truly transnational mindset is achieved when all key stakeholders, including customers, employees, suppliers, investors, and communities, they 
transnational company, you lose the identity of a country of origin. It basically is that you are a world corporation now. Everybody relates to you. In India, you are Indian. In China, you are Chinese in their mindset. They think it's our company. To me, if that can be achieved, which is getting into truly transnational mindset, I think you have enormous sustained competitive advantage. Thank you very much.